it's chapter 26 on the virtue of holiness. In other words, he's talking about how you spiritually grow and the very climax of our spirituality. And personally, I believe one of the reasons why near the end of people's lives, as people normally get a bit older, generally, if they're on the right track, they get a little bit more spiritual. They get to their maximum pace of holiness that the closer it comes to that day of reckoning when we're going to meet Hashem, we start getting on our best behavior, but maybe it's also through experience. You know, when, when I had to say to someone that I'm actually now 50, going on to 51, and I was hoping, thank you, James, putting the link on, at least I'm more experienced. I'm, I'm learning from my mistakes, I hope. And if we all learn from our mistakes, hopefully by the end, we get a lot holier. So the climax is Kedusha. The climax is holiness, which actually fits in very, very connected, Lani, because this week's Pasha in England, anyway, was about Kedoshim, was about holiness. So it's the right time to talk about holiness, to, to really understand what holiness is. So let's have a look. Let's start learning now. So in the middle of chapter of holiness, if you look where it says in Hebrew, Klal on page 179, in summation, this is where we're going from. Okay, let's go. L'chaim, everybody, L'chaim. Okay, in summation, says the Ramchal, holiness consists of one cleaving to Hashem to such an extent that in his performance of any deed, he will neither detach himself nor stir from Hashem. Can you do that? You know, I went to the park today with my children and their children. And I bought them ice cream. And I'm just asking myself now, did I detach from Hashem? I hope not, because I was singing Thank You Hashem all the way through. There's a nice little song going on in my head at the moment. Good na 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 Thank you, Hashem. So I've been thinking that. So I definitely didn't fully detach. We made a nice blessing before the ice cream. Um, yeah, I'm hoping I wasn't detached. But the tzaddik, the real tzaddik, wouldn't even have to think about it. Wherever he goes, whatever he's doing, wherever she is doing they're always connected they're always connected because they're on the right path a little bit like a a very good taxi driver who never veers away from the destination where they're going it's always on track my dear friends the ramchal saying for you and your lives it's really important that whatever you're doing you stay on track so that means even in chill time it's what we spoke about in the past kosher chill even when you're making decisions it's logical, healthy, spiritual decisions, even when you're shopping, you're kosher shopping, your self-control, whatever you're doing on a holiday, there's no such thing of taking a holiday from God, I'm afraid to tell you, right? Hashem is on holiday too with you, and therefore we need to learn that wherever we are in the world, whatever we're doing, we're always connected. The Ramchal says that's real holiness, like a Sefer Torah. If any of you have ever had the pleasure of looking after a Sefer Torah, and when my father passed away, we had a safer terrain at home for a few months because we had a synagogue in our garden. It was during COVID times. The safer terrain never loses its sanctity. <laughs> it doesn't matter where the safer terrain is. The safer terrain could be in an ark. It could be in the car. I've taken safer terrains in the car where I've had to cover it with a tallit and put the seatbelt on the safer terrain. One of my best car rides ever was holding a safer terrain all the way through the car ride because I've never been so holy in my life in the car when you're holding a safer terrain. I was on my best behavior. The Sefer Torah is always on its best behavior. It's holy wherever you take the Sefer Torah. It's holy. It was in my conservatory. It was holy. It was in my dining room. It was holy. Wherever a Sefer Torah goes, it retains the sanctity of the Sefer Torah. Our job, my friends, is to become living Sifrei Torah. It's to becoming holy that wherever we are, we're walking in the streets, we're lying in our beds, we're making breakfast, we're doing it from a place of holiness, we're doing it from a place of self-control, we're always kind, we're always giving someone a smile, we're always, even when we've had a bit of a bad day, doesn't mean you have to kick the cat or all other people in the home. Doesn't mean that. It, maybe you need a bit of go into your cave and just relax a bit and just unwind, but, but you're still holy. Wherever you are, we're holy. We've still got Hashem in us. Whatever we're doing, however bad our day was, the Sefer Torah says the Sefer Torah. When there's tragedy in the world, during the Holocaust, the Sefer Torah still stayed the Sefer Torah as it was living and breathing. It doesn't matter on what's going on around. The, the, the virtual reality doesn't change the status of one's essence, says the Ramchal. And therefore he writes, and as a result of this, the physical objects that he makes use of will become elevated. So right now, my friends, we are elevating Zoom. And I've got news for you. The Holy designer of Zoom is now going to get spiritually rewarded more as a result of this. Because if not for 
and even Facebook and Instagram, Mark Zuckerberg doesn't know how much he owes me. Mark Zuckerberg better have big chats with me in the next world because he's now going to be elevated because a lot of terror has happened because of Facebook. And whoever invented Instagram, one of you can tell me who invented Instagram. I'm sure some of you know that, right? Whoever's in, in and Zoom, they're going to be spiritual giants now because they will have had benefit from all the Torah and the goodness and the charity that's been facilitated due to their conduits, due to their creations. Do you understand this table that I'm sitting on? The wood of that table is now being elevated. That's why we make blessings. You know, I'm making a blessing on this orange juice I made before. Don't worry, mom, I made a blessing. My mom's always saying, you didn't make a blessing. I made a blessing. And when I made that blessing, the fruit, the, the orange, hopefully it was an orange. It was actually, hopefully it wasn't some modified nonsense, but it was hopefully a real orange from a tree that I'm drinking the orange juice. That, that orange is now getting elevated. And by the way, the tree, according to Kabbalah, could have even had a soul inside it. We believe in reincarnation that Arizal teaches us that not only do we come back as human beings, we could come back as inanimate objects, like a tree, like a stone, like a cliff. And therefore, specifically when it comes to wood, specifically when you do a mitzvah from wood, when you have your, a chair, you're sitting on this chair, I'm sitting on, is now being elevated, is now holy earth. There's a consequence. That's why the famous story in Genesis, where Jacob takes 12 stones and puts it around his head. And while he's dreaming of Jacob's ladder, the stones start arguing, say, I want to be the one that Jacob's lying on because it knows the value of the tzaddik being connected to even the inanimate object. They start fighting when he wakes up in the morning, they've now merged into one stone. That means my dear friends, every time you do a kind act, every time you do a mitzvah, every time you learn Torah, you are elevating not just yourself, but that which is around you. That's why it's so important that you learn Torah in your home because it's not just you, that's getting elevated. Your home and your environment is getting elevated. It's really important that your living environment is holy. It's holy. It's important that your friends are holy because it's not just about you. It's about the environment around us. And when we learn, we can elevate all that's around us. And therefore, Sister Amkal, that this depends on constantly focusing one's mind and intellect on Hashem. And this is, I think, one of the key points of this whole book. And I think it's one of the areas what Kabbalah brings to the world. The, the mitzvah is not just about doing an action. It's not doing a ritual. My friends, Judaism is not a ritualistic. It's a relationship. It's a relationship with God. My, too much, too many people have missed Hashem out of Judaism. Like, what's it got to do with God? It's everything to do with Hashem. It's all about one's relationship with Hashem. That's what spirituality, Torah. Hashem wants a relationship with us. That's why he's given us Torah. It's unbelievable how people can get lost in the detail. They can get lost in the law. They can get lost in the matzah on Pesach and they don't realize that we're doing it because that's the way Hashem wants us to relate to him right at that, at that point. And that's what the Ramchal says. That it's all about, and if the more you're focusing of Hashem in your mind, so when something happens to have gratitude, you say, thank you, Hashem. When something happens it doesn't work you can say why Hashem if you want to some people will say even thank you Hashem then if you want something you say please Hashem if you've done something wrong you say sorry Hashem you should be in constant dialogue just like my wife likes to, me to be in constant dialogue with her every hour so she knows always where I am in the world there shouldn't be an hour that goes by and by the way that's healthy the mystics say that that your wife should always know where the husband is always oh, because we're connected so even if you're in different ends of the world, we should know where each other are because we're, we're, we're spiritually connected. On a deep level, that's as an Hashem, the whole point of a soulmate, it's a metaphor. And it's an experiment to see if you can have space for God in your life. So similarly, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, sanctify it by bringing Hashem in your life. Even, you know, when I went on holiday a few weeks ago, it was important on holiday that, I was trying to really grow spiritually at the same time. So every day needed sanctification. Every day there was something new I had to learn. And it was amazing. I took a book of the Baal Shem Tov and, and he really, I, you know, I, I really felt you know, 
we're learning brand new material. It was amazing. So even on a holiday, you're growing, you're learning, you're sanctifying. Next, says the Ramchal. He says, you can't do this on your own, though. You've got to internalize. You've got to learn. You've got to have fear of sin, he writes. And then he says the following, a lot of preparation. Next page. And then he writes on page 180. But after one has prepared himself accordingly. Actually, one last thing. I saw, I saw a beautiful, on the, the notion of the, the tzaddik, whatever he's doing, he's sanctifying all that's around him. There's a story of a great rabbi from 1822, called Rebel Ezra Moshe Horowitz. He was the Rav of Pinsk. The Chazanish related that during Rav Horowitz's lifetime, just the non-Jewish farmers of Pinsk would urge him to walk on their fields at the time of sowing, because they knew that any field that this great sage, this great mystic traversed would be blessed with an abundant crop. It took your non-Jewish farmers of Pinsk to understand that which us Jewish people have no idea. We don't realize the importance you know, I, I've had a few tzaddikim, thank God, coming into my home. It's changed our home forever. If you have a few moments with a great righteous sage, it changes you. My dear friends, it's not a coincidence that this great, the number one in our generation, the great Rabbi Rukhan Kanievsky passed away three weeks ago. There's been chaos in Israel. Terrorist attack after terrorist attack after terrorist attack. Right near where he used to live in B'nai Barak. It's not a coincidence. Rabbi Akiva writes something I learned on Shabbat in the Midrash, in Bayikra, in Leviticus. He writes the following. He said, the Jewish people are compared to a bird. And just like a bird needs wings, we need our leaders. We need our tzaddikim. We need our, our great mystics. They're our wings. When we take the wings off, we fall. So we're saying even when a great tzaddik just walks in your garden, it's all elevated. Tonight, I heard there's a tzaddik that's come to London, a great man called Rav Scheinberg, big, big, a big spiritual guide from, from Israel. So I've just quickly tried to make an appointment to see him. And thank God, I'm hopefully I'm going to be able to see him in a couple of hours just to spend 10 minutes in their company. Just changes who we are. You connect to a higher voltage point. You're connected. It's called going to get a blessing. But it's more than just that they bless you. Just being in their presence blesses you. And therefore, if any of you are living in a country where there's a great sage, then it's worth just traveling even a few hours just to go and get a blessing and, and to go and, 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 and have, that, have that opportunity to meet. Okay, so now let's continue. Says the Ramchal. You see that to acquire this virtue is though through self-control. And you should know what we're going through these weeks of the Sfirah. Sfirah to Omer, my friends, is not merely about counting days. So we're not playing countdown. We're not, we're not just like, ooh, who can count up to 49? That's not the point of the 49 days of the Omer. The real point of the mystics who know what they're doing during the 49 days of the Omer, they're doing tremendous spiritual work. Tremendous work. We've now reached week four. And in, in week one, we were trying to work on what's called chesed, kindness. And then we work on self-control the second week. And the third week, we work on balance. And this week, we work on netzach, which is proactive spirituality. This week is all about proactive spirituality. But tonight, we're about to merge it with self-control within proactive spirituality, learning how to control our spiritual urges when to help, when not to help. And what the Ramchal is saying, it's so important to have self-control. Because without self-control, we're essentially like animals, and therefore, to be definitely, we can't be holy. So he writes, he must there, furthermore be able to direct his thoughts whilst you're engaged in mundane matters, just as the priest should do when slaughtering the sacrifice. And this is something I learned when I was in, when I was away, because uh, let me share with you what I learned. And it was mad. I kept opening the Baal Shem Tov's book. And the first time I, I learned it, afterwards, oh, I was like, what page is it at? And then literally the next three times, I kept opening to the same page. And it was Lamed Tet. It was number 39 of, of his writings in a book called Keser. And this is what the Baal Shem Tov says. Listen to this, because I don't know about you, 
one of the, the ways my evil inclination, my Yitzhahara plays games with me, is it tries to distract me when I'm praying. Whenever I'm praying, all of a sudden, crazy, stupid thoughts comes to mind. Things that I wouldn't normally even bother about. And, I've got, and I, I used to get really frustrated. And what I learned from the Baal Shem was the following. He writes that there's a piece of Talmud that says that there's only two blessings that you really have to have tremendous devotion for. Can you guess what they are? Do you want to, do you want to message in? What are the two most important blessings during prayer, which you've got to do whatever you can to have concentration for? The first what, James? For the first. We're talking about the whole idea of uh, all tefillah, all prayer. There's two prayers. Good. So that's very good, James. So the first blessing in the Amidah, we need to have concentration for. And some say, if you don't, you've got to repeat it. Even though nowadays we shouldn't, because otherwise you're going to be repeating it all day. It's very hard. Not Birkat Torah, David. No, not that one. Actually, the Shema. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokein, Hashem Echad. Very good, Roberto. Shema is the one you've got to have concentration for, as well as the first blessing in the Amidah. But the Talmud says the following. Listen to this. If you say, it's worth coming just to hear this beautiful idea. If you say Shema, and you lose concentration, the Talmud writes, don't say Shema again. And if you do, you're silenced. You're told off if you say Shema twice. And the question is why? Surely if you said Shema the first time, you've had distracted thoughts, then you should say Shema again. Why are you told off if you've repeated the Shema? Says the Baal Shem Tov, and now this is really deep. That if you have a distracted thought, our job is not to A, say, whoa, it's come from an alien place. It's come from some satanic power. So let's say Shema again. The idea of Shema means Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echod. God is one. God is one. It's not two or three. You know, if you're a Catholic, you believe in three. You believe in the Trinity. We don't believe Hashem is three. We believe Hashem is just the one. Just one. That's it. And therefore, everything's Hashem. So even when you have a distracted thought, it's Hashem. Says the Baal Shem Tov, if you say Shema twice, you're almost saying there's two deities. There's two gods. That's polytheism. That's the belief in more. The Greeks used to believe in the God of the sun, the God of the moon, and, and the Egyptians and the pharaohs used to believe in that too. We're not like that. What it means to be Jewish, the DNA of Judaism is Hashem Echot, which means on a deep level, whatever happens in life, the good news, but even the bad news, that's also God. That's why when something even horrendous happens, we still make a blessing. Say, Baruch Dayan Ahmed. We're still blessing the one. It's all coming from one source. And therefore, says Baal Shem Tov, when we have a distracted thought, our job A is not to feel guilty and say, oh, you know, I'm some like bipolar spiritual Jew. It doesn't mean that. It means that you're normal and you're human and your job is can you take that distracted thought and then channel it to Hashem and fix it. And the Baal Shem Tov something amazing. King David writes the famous line, so meira ba'asei tov, which we normally translate as turn away from evil and do good which is the basic concept which the Lutzato has talked about, that before you do good, you've got to do a bit of refining, filtering. You've got to learn how to have self-control and then do good. But the Baal Shem Tov stops something amazing. So Meira, turn around the bad. The Asay Tov and do good. So Meira, let's turn that evil into good. Which means turn those distracted thoughts and say, how can I elevate those thoughts? So for example, if, you are, if you're thinking about during prayer, you start thinking about your holiday. But then you start saying, wow, the, even the fact that I can go on a holiday, that's from Hashem. Now let's go straight back to Hashem. What you're doing, you're even sanctifying your distracted thoughts, which means let's say you're, you're being bothered by certain worries. Instead of staying in that world of worry or being bothered, what you're meant to do is turn those thoughts into blessings. Turn those thoughts into Oh, I'm really happy I had those thoughts because now I understand God better. Now I can almost overcome that hurdle and get to a higher place as a result of that. It's a very deep idea. And it needs a lot of thought, but essentially that's what Lutzato is saying here. And we're going to see soon there's an amazing link, my friends, between Lutzato and the Baal Shem Tov, even though they didn't meet. And we'll speak about that more when it comes to the climax of what he says. Then he writes, what's also going to help you in holiness is solitude. And seclusion without disturbance. Sadik, it's very interesting. 
this poor Rosh Hashiva. He's come to London, this great man, this very great sage, and we don't have many greats in London. So when someone comes, everyone's after him. He has probably been inundated, poor guy, from the moment he wakes up, you know, probably for literally, he's probably going to sleep at one in the morning, maybe two, maybe three. And there's going to be just queues of people queuing up for blessings. And all they want to do really is, is just be alone and learn Torah and, and just keep on learning and keep connecting and keep praying. And, but we bother them and bother them and bother them because that's their job in this world. They have to find the time to learn in, the, in a few little moments of free time. That's what they're here for. That's why, by the way, then if you know, when someone passes away, you're not meant to go to their grave too much. The, the, the mystic's right. Don't bother them too much because every time you go to their grave, a lot of their soul has to come from where they are, resting in the world of the souls, and come and have a chat with you. So we can't, it's like, you know, you're on the phone and someone knocks on the door, so they come downstairs and open the door. It's a bit of a pain sometimes. It's, it's arduous. It takes a little bit of effort. So there's something called spiritual effort, and we're taking away from their chill time and resting with Hashem. So you shouldn't keep going. shouldn't keep going. You should go. The yacht sign, if you're on a birthday or an anniversary, you know, maybe three, four times a year, max. Apart from a tzaddik, a tzaddik, you can go every day if you want. And tzaddik, in, like in, this, in the in Meron, or Shem Bayochai, there's always someone there. And the Arizal, there's always someone there. And King David, there's always someone there. And Hebron, there's always someone there. And not just one, there's not many hundreds there the whole time. Why? So how can we do that? It's not fair. We're not allowing them rest. The answer is tough. They're not meant to rest. They're a tzaddik. That's what comes from being at the head. If you're the tzaddik, you're selfless and you're selfless in your death as well. You're selfless in the afterlife too. You know, so much so that the Lubavitcher Rebbe in, in Lubavitch, they've created a system now where you can fax the Rebbe questions, even though he's passed away many years ago, which just means they, they, they t- the, the, the institution takes the fax that you've sent and then puts it by his grave. And hopefully if you make a prayer, he'll know and he'll you know, be able to, it's as if you go there in a sense, meaning a tzaddik is selfless, not just in this world, but in the next world too. That comes with the gig. If you want to be a tzaddik, you're not going to have a lot of rest time. What the Ramcha is saying for most mere mortals, in order to become truly great, you actually need, need a bit of quiet time. You need a bit of time away from the hustle and bustle and from the craziness and from maybe from, from perhaps bad friends. Sometimes if you have friends that are bring you down, that are toxic, that are, that are full of Lashon Hara, that are full of triggering you and bringing out the worst in you, it stops you from becoming holy. We have to learn how to balance our, our friend time with what's best for you time and learn to have that self-control. So the Lord's also saying, on one hand, solitude's important. On the other hand, the commentaries on, on Father of the Just Day, yet the mission in Pirkei Avot says, it's important to have friends. You should acquire yourself friends. We believe in socialization with social beasts. It's in, we, we, Hashem wants us spiritually to be like, right now, we're inspiring each other. On Zoom, on Instagram, and Facebook, we're inspiring each other. It's good that we're spending time with each other because it's good. We're getting closer to God as a result of the community and as a result of unity. That's what J Network's about. It's about bringing Jews from all around the world together in one network and helping each other and inspiring each other. So on one hand, it's good to be with people. On the other hand, if you're with the wrong people and with too much people too much of the time, you're not going to be able to have that ability to grow. And it's like everything in life. It's about balance. But Lutzato is explaining that at a certain point to become holy one needs to have solitude. And that's why great sages have to spend a lot of time in Yeshiva when Rabbi Akiva really understood what life's about and what Torah's about. He had a chat with his wife. We'll learn about it more next week with his wife, Rachel, and said, I've got to go and learn. And Rachel says, you can go and learn for as long as you want. You can go be away from me. I don't care. I want you to become great. I want you to become like Moshe Rabbeinu, become like Moses. Because what about 12 years? Sure. Will you be all right without seeing me for 12 years? She said, sure. You do what's needed. And he went away for 12 years. 12 years. And he's finally coming back. And by the way, they didn't have smartphones in those days. And they weren't speaking to each other. And they weren't doing WhatsApp calls. This is 2,000 years ago. And he finally comes back with 12,000 students to go. And finally, the end of his 12 years are up. 
and he's now come back to his wife and he became genuinely great by being away from society for 12 years. He became one of the greats. And he overhears his wife saying to her friend, the following, the friend is like, your husband, he's meant to be this great rabbi, but it's not very great. He's not being very nice to you. What about the mitzvah of looking after his wife? And she said, don't you dare talk about, talk about my husband in that way. And this is the words he heard her say. She said, and if he feels he's got to be for another 12 years, I'm more than happy. That's what he needs. When he heard that Rabbi Akiva, he realized it's a message from Hashem. And he realized there was more to be achieved. And he turned around. He didn't even knock on the door. He turned around and went straight back. And only came back 12 years later with now 24,000. And the famous question is, why didn't he at least knock in and say, let's have a little chat. How are you doing? Give you a hug. Let's have a cup of tea together. Why didn't he just say hi? So the romantics amongst you, do you, you want a message and answer him? Why didn't he just go and say hi? Why did he just like blank her, ghost her as you'd call it, and not even walk in? Do you want to chat, put an answer in? So the romantics say, exactly. Once they see each other and they give each other a hug, they will never be able to pull each other away from each other. And that will be the end of that. It will be too painful. So I like that, James. You're romantic. Hashem should always enable you to stay romantic. But the Moshe Rechaim Shmulevich, Rashi Ramirez, has a different answer, which is this concept of solitude, this concept of continual learning. If you're going to have 24 years of learning, 24 years is only 24 years consecutively. 12 plus 12 does not equal 24. If a, if a kettle needs to be boiled for two minutes, and by the way, I've got the worst kettle in the world, it's about three minutes and it's so long. It's like, anybody wants to buy me a nice new kettle, I'm so up for that, right? So I've got this rubbish kettle, it's so long. I'm like, I do not have time to wait around. You know, I, I should be, you know, I, how many much I could have learned while well, I'm waiting these three minutes for this kettle. So I try and obviously do things, but it's just, t- anyway, sorry about the kettle. None of you made that kettle. Not your fault. But the point is, if it's a two minute kettle and you boil it for 60 seconds, stop, chill out a bit, and then do another 60 seconds, it ain't going to boil. If any of you want to go to the gym and get, get to a certain level of fitness, and, and you, you need to do an hour's running to get to that level of fitness. An hour is very different from 30 minutes. Stop, go and have a cup of tea, go and have a bagel, and then another half an hour. That's not, it's, it's the continuousness of it. That's why I'm actually a very big believer in 60 minute talks. A lot of people say to me, wow, who can actually learn for 60 minutes? Like really? Do like five minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour, 60 minutes. In the day of ADHDs, who's got time for six? I, I believe you really want to achieve things. At the very least, one hour. To be quite honest, I'm happy to go for three hours. To be honest, you're up for that. In yeshiva, we go from nine to one o'clock. So and now nine to 12, a little break, and we have a class for an hour. So I'm happy to do three hours if anybody wants that. But at least an hour, because 60 minutes is something. It says in the time where Yish Kona Olam Abala, the Shai Chat, to require the world to come in one hour. So that's what we try and do. It's one hour, 60 minutes. We can't handle 60 minutes. You're in the wrong place. And, and that's why Rabbi Akiva says Rabbi Shulevich didn't go in the house. Because if he would have gone in the house, he would have had to start again. He would never have achieved 24. Anyway, that's what Lusasa is saying, the importance of solitude. Then he writes, the factors that lead to the loss of this virtue of the lack of true knowledge. And that's the one big, big problem, ignorance. You know, everyone loves the phrase, ignorance is bliss. But actually, it might be bliss, but it's still ignorant. And then you stay ignorant, and it's definitely not holy. If you want to be holy, you can't be ignorant. You can't be ignorant. You have knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. You know, if Sivan's there or some of your other people that maybe I've spoken to, I've always said for you to grow to where you need to get to, it's critical knowledge, 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 knowledge. With knowledge and wisdom, then you can start making good decisions in life and good choices. But until you have knowledge... You haven't got a clue what is good, what is not good. First and foremost, knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. It's all about knowledge. And therefore, he writes, ignorance and lack of true knowledge can lead and can detract from holiness. And then he says, this is a scary lie. While the soul remains in captivity, unable to escape its prison. Question for you. Is your soul in captivity? What do you think? Is your soul in prison or is your soul free? 
Isn't that an interesting thing to think about? So I believe when people are depressed, when people are lonely, when people are disconnected from God, the soul is most definitely in prison. Maybe you've had phases in your life where you felt your soul in prison. And that's super sad. And your soul is definitely sad. I believe and mystics say a lot of depression isn't merely problems of chemicals in your brain. The mystics say your soul's unhappy. It's not being fulfilled. It's not being nourished. It's not doing what it's meant to do. So the, the, the real part of you is kind of sad. It's like a sad child crying in the bedroom. But it's locked up. The child can't get out. We almost sometimes put the soul with a gag in its, in its mouth and chuck it in the boot of the car and close the car. So a lot of people don't even realize they have a soul. They can't even hear the soul speak. The Ramchal is explaining for so many people, the soul is in captivity. The soul is in prison. My dear friends, when we're learning Torah, we're releasing our soul from prison. When you do a mitzvah, when you do an act of kindness, when you pray, when you do Shabbat, kosher, what you're doing is, is you're releasing your soul and you're, you're taking your soul from prison to a beautiful spiritual castle, to a spiritual mansion, which is amazing. The greatest sage in our generation, Chaim Kanievsky, lived in a little shack. He lived in a one-bedroom apartment, whereas the bedroom was almost in the same room as where he was learning, but it was a mansion. It was, it was greater than Buckingham Palace because the spirituality and the aura the whole world was, was revolving around that little room. That's how great it was. And I said to my student this morning, do you want to build your palace in this world or in the next? And if you want to build your palace in the next world, then this world also becomes what we call a spiritual palace. So my student said, can I have both? You can. You can. The Talmud says some people are lucky enough to have both. But most people don't. Most people, you've got to choose where you want it. Where do you want your riches? Where do you want your wealth? Up to you. Then he writes like this. However, when he detaches himself from people and remains alone and you prepare for his holy inspiration, then he's led along the path that he desires to travel. And with Hashem's assistance is given to him, his soul will be strengthened. He'll rule over the physical. So what's the key? The key is and, and I don't know if any of you have felt this. Sometimes you've got to go against the tide. You've got to do things that maybe society might say, are you mad? Like, hello, you've got a great opportunity and you're just not taking that opportunity. One of my, one of my dear students, one of my friends, he was a guy called, you might have heard, a very famous pop star. You can look him up after us, called Alex Clare. So Alex Clare, when he was becoming religious, when he was becoming observant, he, he got to a place where, where he was keeping Shabbat. He starts keeping Shabbat. That moment he starts, he, he was a musician. He was like an up-and-coming musician. The moment he decides to keep Shabbat, Hashem starts having a joke with him, playing with him. Adele calls. You've heard of Adele? He calls Alex and says, can you, I would like you to play on my concert. I'd like you to open my concert for me. He said, it's amazing, super up for it. Alex says, when's it happening? It's happening in April 14th. He says, awesome. He looked in his diary, first night Passover. First night Passover. He had the decision to make. Was he either going to keep Pesach or play with Adele? Everyone thought he was bonkers to turn Adele down. You want to become a musician. You want to become successful. Really? You're going to turn down Pesach? And he turned down Adele, one of the only ones probably in the world that ever, like her husband, turned down Adele, right? Sorry for that. So he turned down Adele. Sorry, Adele, hope you forgive me, right? But I'm sure you turned them down, right? So he turned down Adele, and, and, and then he gets another test from Hashem, the following Sukkot, where he's asked to go on the BBC. He had to go on the BBC, and, and as James just put in, he lost an album deal with Island Records because he had to turn down the BBC on Sukkot. And everyone thinks he's crackers, he's bonkers, he's mental. And he wants to become successful. Agents didn't want to work with him. And then what happens? Hashem says, okay, Alex, now you've passed your test. You've gone against the tide. Now I'll reward you in both worlds. You're becoming spiritually great. I'll let you become musically great too. And all of a sudden, Microsoft, heard of Microsoft? They heard of one of his old songs. 
be too close, which maybe James wants to put a link onto on 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 on, the, on there. Too close, and they start playing too close, and all of a sudden it becomes this huge crazy hit, and all the money starts rolling in, and the fame starts rolling in. But he had to overcome his test, and he had to do something against the tide. Abraham is called Abraham Ivri. If we want to be Jewish, part of being Jewish is to do against the tide, to do things which maybe is not popular. We can't be people pleasers and God pleasers at the same time. Sorry, got to decide who are we pleasing. Yes, Hashem wants us to be kind to people. He's written that in last week's Parashat, the most important mitzvah of all. You should love your friend like you love yourself. So we have to be lovers to people, but not people pleasers. The problem with the people pleasers is we just want to please someone irrespective of what's right and wrong. And at times Hashem is going to test you and say, are you willing to do what's right, even though society will say you're crazy? But the Ramchal is saying when we're able to overcome that and do what's right for Hashem, then you start becoming blessed. When you just find that strength to make that jump in the sea, like Nachshon ben Aminadab did during the Red Sea, and he jumped in, and it was still the sea, but got to his neck and then it splits but we've got to jump in we've got to make that decision to go against the ties and by the way if you feel that's never happened to you that's not a good sign that's a sign you've been taking it way too easy you're not swimming the spiritual waters any of you that is growing spiritually will know how hard it is and will know how often there's resistance and how often people around you might try and hold you back and that's an amazing sign because that means that if you're able to make the right decision, you're going to be tremendously blessed and become holy. And then he writes like this. From this point, he'll be elevated even to a higher plane, that of Ruach HaKodesh, divine inspiration, where your understanding will transcend the limits of human capabilities. I've met people, they know things, they see things, they can see literally into your future. When you really genuinely meet a walking Sefer Torah, they, just, they don't see you, they see your soul. They see your souls. They see your previous lives. Look up stories. James put a link called Baba Sali, B-A-B-A-S-A-L-I. He was a great master of seeing things that no one, once someone came to Baba Sali, maybe like it would be nice, James, to put a, a picture of him as well so you can see what he looks like. He was so great in his eyes. It was piercing. Famous story of Baba Sali. Once a family went to see him, went to see him, and they wanted to know where their child is. The child had left home. He'd, he'd run away. They hadn't found their child. He was lost. The police couldn't find him. No one knew. They came to his little apartment in the Tivot in Israel. Baba Sali took one look at them, saw the name of the son, said, one minute. He starts drawing London Town. He starts drawing like a roadmap, Oxford Street, building, number 32, with an X. He says he's over there. True story. I promise you, true story. And they called the police and they went to there and he found him. How did he know that? Because he got to such a level of holiness. He wasn't here. He, his soul was soaring the world. He was able to see other sides of the world, not just in our lifetime, but other lifetimes. And, and, and Baba Sali was classic of that. And I really, when, I, when people need help, I often really advise I think the number one in the world in that genre is his grandson, Abu Khatsera, who's also a rabbi in, in the Tibot. And, and, and I, really, I really recommend if anybody needs help, trying, trying to go to him. Because, you know, one of my students went to him from Israel, and she was a, a, a girl who um, went to him. She was married, and their, the doctor had said that their baby was suffering from a terrible... Uh, condition wasn't going to last and the husband wanted her to abort no sorry she wanted to abort the mother wanted to abort you know you've got the old anti-abortion thing going on in america now it's a good example you know so she wanted to abort the husband didn't the husband said at least before you abort let's come to the rabbi let's see what he says she goes to the rabbi he takes one look at her closes his eyes makes a blessing opens his eyes say your baby's fine now don't worry it's all good it's absolutely fine She's like, uh, I saw the x-rays. He goes, the baby's fine. It's all good. We fixed it. She went back to the hospital. They did another x-ray. He was healed. He healed the baby. Don't ask. Who know? I know her. 
If anyone doesn't believe my story, I'm happy to put you in contact with her. And, and she's got a beautiful baby boy, beautiful baby boy. I've seen him a few times. It's gorgeous. So it works. It just works. One of the reasons of, of anti-abortion. We're not, we're not into abortion in Jewish law in most general cases. Other than the first six weeks, the first 40 days is, is not, we don't believe that's where the soul comes in. We believe the soul comes in to the fetus after 40 days. Anyway, let's continue. Says Lutzato. So they can see Ruach HaKodesh, as I just brought the example of Baba Sali. And his estate of cleaving will, will permit him to re reach such a lofty plane. He can receive the key of resurrection, the dead, like Elisha and Elio. This demonstrates the great intensity of cleaving. It says in the Talmud Tanit, page two, three keys were not placed in the hands of a messenger. The key for resurrection. Therefore, the one who cleaves to Hashem completely will be able to tap from even the very flow of his life which more than anything else is particularly attributed to him. That's where mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation comes from. That in, in the book of the prophets, Elisha the prophet were able to do a mouth-to-mouth -mouth and actually resurrected someone that, that had died. Isha Shunamit. The Talmud in Abu Zara, page 20, says, and holiness leads to divine inspiration. Divine inspiration leads to the resurrection of the dead. We believe in resurrection of the dead. And for, oh, for those cynics amongst you who say, resurrection of the dead, don't be daft. If I were to tell you what happens to a seed, you put a seed in the ground and it decomposes and it disintegrates and it, 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 it dissolves and dissipates. And then guess what? It starts growing again. And it's called a tree. And it's called a plant. Just Hashem hasn't yet done that for, for, for human beings. But he will. It's all. 40 years. You know, it's amazing. My six-year-old son, my six-year-old grandson, I don't have a son of six. I would be much more stressed if I had a son who was six. A grandson, who is my six-year-old grandson, at the moment in school, they're teaching him what it's going to be like when Mashiach comes. One of his questions is, how many years after Mashiach will it be when there's resurrection? And my little six-year-old son knows the answer. 40 years. 40 years. It's really cool. Now, I didn't learn that when I was six. And, and I don't know if any of you learned that when you were six, but he's going to be a very great sage one day. You're going to go to him for a blessing. He's got to look out for him. Rafael Moshe Black. Anyway, sorry for that. Little promo for my spiritual subject of the grandson, but I hope he's not listening to get a big head. 40 years after Mashiach, everyone will come back, which by the way means if Mashiach comes tonight and you've lost a relative, you're going to see that and you're going to see him in 40 years or her in 40 years. And you might say, Will I still be around? It gets complicated. I don't want to get into that. But yeah, eventually we're all together. We're all together. Everyone's going to be together at the end. So let's continue. And now he writes the following. It's going to get emotional now for me because I've spent two years now teaching you this. And we're about to hit the climax. He says the following. Tells us, dear readers, I'm feeling connected to the Rampal. He says, as for you, dear reader, I realize you would recognize as I do that in this work, I have not come to the end of all of the learning pertaining to piety. In other words, I've just touched on it. We're just, we're just, <laughs> it's a whole book, but he's trying to say, don't think you now know the secrets of piety. And that's it. He goes, we're just literally touching on the surface. And there's no end to the matter. But I've said something about each particular composition. This may serve as a beginning, a gateway for the study. So the Ramchal is saying, like any good teacher, that this is just the beginning. Because the thing about spirituality, my dear friends, I've got news for you. Hashem is infinite. The journey is an infinite journey. You've never completed it. As it says in Pirkei Avot, Ethics for Fathers, Lo alecha amlacha ligmar. It's not upon you to complete the task. On the other hand, we're not exempt from it. There's an infinite job where we just have to try our best. But it, you've never, all these books behind me, let's just say I was able to memorize all of them. I've got another thousand, thousands and thousands. There's no end. There's no end. There's no end. It's not like I've learned all of Torah or I've done all acts of kindness. It's infinite. And therefore, in reference to the things of this nature, on the last page, it's quite emotional. It says in Proverbs, Chapter one, number five, the learned person will listen and increase his knowledge and the contemplative one will acquire profundities. So again, it's critical. And I think if anything, one of the takeaways you need to take from this book is more than anything, learn, find another book. That's why we're going to another book. And then when we finish that book, open another book and then another book. It's a journey of learning. And that is never enough. And then he writes, and one who seeks to be purified is assisted. And one of, one of this, the 
put this into your subconscious now. Are you ready? And it's Hebrew, v'habar, v'taher, m'sayinata, which means, my dear friends, all you need to say is, I want to try. You need to say, Hashem, okay, we haven't been as close as we can be, but I'd like to be closer. The moment you genuinely say, and you're prepared to make small changes in your life, to say, Hashem, let me be closer, wow, you will get so much help, you won't know what to do with it. You're just going to get a blessing from there and a blessing from there. And all of a sudden, it's going to be super easy for a bit. And then it gets hard again. But if you try, you get tremendously helped. You have to try. You have to try. You can't say, I want to want. That's not enough. Sorry. You've got to want. You've got to want. You've got to be prepared to make small changes. And in your heart and soul, say, I want to get closer to you, God. I'm missing you. I want to get closer. Help me get closer and prepare to make some changes. Bang. Hashem will help you. And then another line says, For the eternal will impart with ki Hashem yitain chokma, mi piv dasus funa. For Hashem will give you wisdom from his mouth will come knowledge and understanding to direct each person's path before his creator. You know, uh, just now before we came on, I went to my rabbi and said, I've got, a, I've got a dilemma. Should I go A or B? And he helped direct me. That's what we're meant to have. We're meant to have rabbis. And they direct us, and they're meant to have rabbis, and they're meant to have rabbis, and they're meant, we're always meant to have spiritual leaders who can help guide, but then we have to ultimately make the decisions. And then he says the following, the penultimate paragraph of this book, we can easily, or this masterpiece, we can easily understand that every person needs direction and guidance in accordance with your own specific skills and occupations, since the path of piety is appropriate for the one who tarries his vocation. It's unsuitable for another one. In other words, let's explain what he's saying here now. Very important idea. This is somewhat revolutionary, and this is where many mystics are amazed. This is so similar to the Baal Shem Tov. Even though they didn't meet, we don't think they met. We've got no evidence that Lutzato and the Baal Shem Tov met. They're singing from the same hymn sheet. They're, they're saying the same kind of Torah. Let me explain. In those days, we were talking about 300 years ago, in the Orthodox world, it was essentially... If you were doing full-time Torah learning, then you're a Torah scholar. If you weren't cut out for it, you really didn't know much at all. You were super ignorant. And, and people thought that the Torah is only for the wise. It's only for those that that's their profession. And Lutzato saying, God forbid. And the Baal Shem Tov said, God forbid. Torah is for every single person, whoever you are, whatever you're doing. You know, we have Lisa, the lawyer there. We have Sivan, the recruitment boss. We have, who else do we have with us today, right? We have Cyril, the postman. Whatever you're doing, whatever you're doing, Hashem wants you to connect to him, whatever your profession is. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a place for you. It's not just a place for the scholars. We can all have a taste of scholarly work. We all have a portion of Torah. We all have a portion of spirituality. We all have a unique path. There's an amazing thing. Maimonides writes in the laws of Shiva, the laws of repentance, chapter five, law number two, the following. He writes, every single one of you has the capability of becoming like Moses. He writes that. You can all become like Moshe Rabbeinu. And the question is, what are you talking about? We've been seeing the song, Yen Yigdal, Lo Kombi Yisrael Kamosha Ob Nabi. There's been even no prophet like Moses. What does this mean we can all become like Moses? Even prophets can't become like Moses. Can you become like Moses? The answer is, of course not. But Moshe achieved the level of Moshe. When God said Moshe, Moshe, he meant the potential of Moshe became the realization of Moshe. Moshe Rabbeinu fulfilled his potential. Maimonides is saying, Verda, you become like Verda. Renee become like Renee. Lisa become like Lisa. Cyril become like Cyril. That's your job. Hashem is not going to say to you, Lisa, why did you become like Sarah? Or Matriarch. Or Rebecca. You're lucky. You're not going to be compared to her. You're going to be compared to you. That's it. Which is good news and bad news. The good news is it's terrible. The bad news is you don't have an excuse. You can't say, whoa, I wasn't cut out for it. What do you mean? That's exactly who you're going to be compared to. You. In other words, we've all got different gifts. Those the more artistic, those the more autistic, those the more mathematical, those the more creative. It's awesome because those gifts you've been given is to help assist you on your spiritual path. 
That's it. They're the instruments for your own part. It's not, Hashem hasn't made mistakes. He hasn't given you the wrong gift. You've got exactly the right gift you need, exactly the right gift you need. Perfect for your own project that you're meant to achieve in this universe. And therefore, every single human being, and that's why I'm so passionate about putting on social media because it's so cool when someone from the other side of the world stumbles into this and is like, whoa, this touches my soul, this nourishes me. Absolutely. Torah is for everybody. It's like water. It's for everyone. Everyone deserves it. Everyone needs to be nourished by it. You, you, this isn't just for the chief rabbi. This isn't, you know, just for the great. This is for, we're all great. We're all great. It says, Isaiah says, everybody's a tzaddik. Everybody's got the divine soul in you. And that makes you incredibly great. And therefore, we need to feed that divine soul. If we don't, it's going to feel like it's in captivity. It's going to feel like it's in prison. And you might get depressed. You don't know, why am I depressed? Because your nasham is missing out. The divine spark in you is like, hello, what about me? Connect me. I need to be connected. I need to be nourished. I need mitzvahs. And then he writes the following. And this is the case regarding all the particulars of human affairs in this world. There is a path to piety. That's not to say that every nature of piety varies but in the view that the circumstances are changing. And by the way, even for you in your own path, sometimes different, there's different periods, there's different chapters. There's a five-year period, a two-year period, a 10-year period. Sometimes we have, to, we have to move around a bit, maybe move countries, maybe move professions even. It's complicated spirituality. You've got to kind of follow the string, follow the yellow brick road. You know the song? I'm not going to sing it. Everyone's got to follow their own yellow brick road. And that means Hashem is sending you breadcrumbs. Just follow the breadcrumbs. Follow the messages. That's going to help direct you and guide you. And the Sartre writes, but in view of the fact that circumstances are changing, this, this means leading towards the implementation of the goal must also vary. It's impossible that someone who out of necessity is a simple artisan may become a completely pious person like an individual who never stops learning. But then it says the eternal created everything for his own sake. And it says in all of your ways, know him. And he will direct your path. A very important line. Very important line. Behold, Rachel, you. In all of your ways, know him. So I saw a beautiful idea that at the end of this, at the beginning of Genesis, the beginning of Genesis, it talks about the, it talks about Adam and Eve eating from the tree. And the Bible says they planted the tree of life in the middle of the garden. And the mystics explain that middle is equidistant from all the edges. That whatever one's station in life, wherever you're in the garden, he's no further from the tree of life than another person in a different situation. Meaning you're all connected to the tree we're all in the next world my friends you know what it is it's circles dancing with god in a circle and we're all going to be exactly where we need to be and we're all hashem's in the middle of the circle and wherever you are in that circle you're going to be as close to god as someone else because the lawyer's got to achieve their spirituality through that area and the doctor through that area and the defender of israel and the army through that area and the teacher through that area and, and we, we've all got to do like an angel Raphael is a healer that's it so similarly we have spiritual jobs to do in this world and whatever our job is just by fulfilling that that's going to allow you to have your closest to God and as the Baal Shem Tov says the line where God says to Moses by the burning bush the first time they really have the first meeting by the burning bush and Hashem says take off your shoes from your feet because the place where you are standing on is holy the Baal Shem and the Chavos Chaim also says this. The place you're standing on is holy is wherever you are in the world. Verder in Turkey, you're exactly where you need to be right now. We're all exactly where we need to be. Don't think, oh, I'm in the wrong place. Maybe tomorrow. But right now, you're where you need to be. The place where you're standing is holy. And you're meant to say, out of the situation I'm in now, what is the best way to maximize my day? What is the best way to connect me to Hashem right now? That's what we're meant to ask of ourselves every single day. And then finally, the last paragraph. 
May Hashem in His mercy open our eyes through His Torah and guide us in His ways and lead us in His paths. And maybe we, we be worthy of glorifying His name and pleasing Him. And his, he, he concludes his masterpiece by the verse in Psalms, May the glory of Hashem endure forever. Let Hashem rejoice in His works, which are you. Meaning the whole book is about the fact that Hashem loves you. Hashem loves you. Hashem loves you and Hashem is proud of you. And, and Hashem wants you to be proud of yourself and wants you to maximize your life. And that's what this whole book's about. And he finishes off. Or let Hashem rejoice in his maker that the sons of Zion exult in their king. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for being with me on this journey of, of learning with Silas Yisharim. Thank you so much, Hashem, for allowing me to to teach this holy book and to be part of the journey of sharing it with you. Thank you so much to Ramchal and Mishra Chaim Luxato for allowing me to, 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 to share your holy works. I hope I've done you proud and I hope I've done it in, with the holiness that, that you've asked. And as I said, it's, it's really emotional because it's been a two year journey. And if you've missed most of it, which I'm sure some of you have, the good news is it's on YouTube, on our channel, J Network 613. And you can go back and you put every single one of it up there. And thank you so much for Carla for putting it up there every week. And thank you so much for yourselves for being with me on this journey. What we'd like to do is next Sunday night, we'll start our new book of Duties of the Heart. But before that, please bring a your favorite alcohol and your favorite kosher cream cake with you and we can just have a little celebration we'll say another little word of the Celeste Shorium just to do what we call a seum just to celebrate that the, it's a big it's a big thing my dear friends if you finish this book you'll be able to take this book with you in the next world and trust me you're going to want it because that means we can we can access his mansion we can spend time with the Ramchal himself we can learn from his Torah if any of you like Sivan is going to Israel soon go to his grave it's in Tiberias it's next to Rabbi Akiva the mystics say the, the Rabbi Akiva comes back. The first 40 years of Rabbi Akiva's life where he wasn't spiritually connected was then lived again in the life of the Ramchal. And that's why they're buried together in an area where there's no other bodies. The big grave in Tiberias, the grave site where Maimonides is and many of the, the Tanaim are in a very different place, minutes away. This is over the hill and far away. And I got to the top of the hill and I went to the Ramchal and I couldn't believe my eyes. Right next to his grave is Rabbi Akiva. They're connected. So if Sivan's going to go in a few weeks, send him my love. Say, I hope to see him soon. And, and if any of you are going to Tiberius, I would recommend going to his grave. And But if you haven't completed it, do it in your own time and you can do it with me because you can just listen to it, download the talks on YouTube and just do it in your own time. So again, thank you so, so much for joining with me.